Hello. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it five already? Not yet. Sure. Not yet. And remember, almost doesn't count. So, good afternoon. How is your neighbor? Do you know your neighbor's name? Yeah. What do they do? <laughs> Are you sure? So, um, attention. My name is Michael Clement Namawa, and um, it's a privilege to be your host for today. Welcome to our Policy Lab series, and today is APC Policy Lab 7. We want to welcome the staff of Uganda Christian University, the student community, the teaching and non-teaching staff, and uh, thank you for coming in this number, and thank you for listening. Today we have something interesting, something new, our guest presenter is in the house. She's not new, but she's new to some of us. She has been with us before, and she has talked about philanthropy. So now we are going to delve into something interesting. But before we delve into something interesting, allow me to invite our very own Erisa to lead us through a word of prayer. And then I'll invite the director, Africa Policy Center, Reverend Dr. Professor Lawrence Adams, who will later on invite our guest speaker, and then, no, not to invite, not to invite else one, yes, but to invite our speaker. So ladies and gentlemen, may we rise for a prayer. Assemble ourselves for a prayer. Father, we want to thank you for our lives. We want to thank you for this opportunity that you've given us to be in your presence, to also be here. And we pray for the speaker and everyone that is here that we are going to listen and appreciate knowledge and also add value to this very opening of knowledge. But also, most importantly, that this document will translate into policies that are going to impact our society and the generation that to come. We are praying for all those people who have an intention of coming. May you quicken their footsteps to be here. And we pray for calmness and understanding. We thank you. We bless your holy name. We pray all this through Jesus Christ our Lord. Thank you so much. You may have your seats. Allow me now to invite our director. Good afternoon. Welcome. Thank you. I apologize for the delay. Those of you that are in law, it's a bit like waiting for the judge to appear to open the court. Uh, and there's always something, but we are beginning because we have a very interesting time together. I'm very happy to uh, invite <laughs> to recognize uh, Jackie Asimwe, who's a friend. Now, she's been with us before for a previous policy lab, and we were so taken with the information, the subject matter, the discussion that she led for us regarding this very important topic of philanthropy. Philanthropy uh, is a word that means the love of mankind, but it's used for our generosity, our giving, and it takes many different forms, as I think we'll probably uh, here today. Uh, and Western forms and African forms can be very different from each other. Uh, so we have a lot to think about in how we are generous in giving of our means to those in need. I think those are some of the things we're being prepared to uh, encounter today. Jackie is the CEO of CivSource, which in the US would be called, I think, a public interest law firm. Maybe that's uh, not quite how she would describe it. As you can tell, she's a lawyer and a, an attorney. We've already uh, clocked up her billable hours <laughs> sitting and waiting, but she's uh, generously uh, devoted her time for us. Those of you that were not here earlier missed her mic check, and we learned a lot of, about her, uh, including that she's married and has two very handsome sons. And she's also a, um, I guess you'd say a granddaughter of this institution, right? Her father is an Anglican clergyman who is a graduate of uh, Bishop Tucker. So she's already familiar with our, our institution, at least in its former form. Mm -hmm. She's a PK. Uh, any PKs here? Preacher's kids? You know what that's like. OK, well, you already have a sister. <laughs> so this is uh, Jackie Asimwe. Please welcome her to address this. Question. are not very cavalry. <laughs> we saw them when we came to Uganda. Okay. Okay. 
move away from that. Yeah. We need feedback. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all fine. Thank you for keeping time, those that did. We are sorry for keeping you waiting. We were waiting for more of you to come, but we also had to test a few tech things. It's my honor and pleasure to be back here at my home when I was a little girl, as my father studied to be a reverend. I came with a colleague of mine, Eshban Kwesiga. Please wave to the people. Eshban works with us at CivSource and in particular works with me on our philanthropy work. Mark is approaching me. Okay, I thought I had done something wrong. Okay, so I was told to tell you a little more about myself. I introduce myself as a lawyer by profession and an advocate by calling. The way I define an advocate is one who gives voice to. And I feel like in my life I have lent my voice to many causes, chiefly women's rights, but many other things along the way. I'm a pastor's child. At some point when my father was chaplain at Macquarie University, we started a pastor's children's association. And one of our primary, primary aims was to give voice to the issues our parents face that they cannot tell their bishop in case they are fired. So we took it upon ourselves as pastor's children to talk about things like retirement benefits, if at all, to talk about things like how the way pastors are posted affects the families because you're suddenly settling in and then you're uprooted. And I think without thinking about how it affects the rest of the family, we talked about things like how our mothers are literally church workers that are unpaid because when you're a pastor's wife, you're literally the co-pastor. You will head the women's ministry, mother's union, Sunday school, Monday school, and yet you're not paid, right? I, but you're supposed to be there. So those are the kinds of things we talked about as the Pastors Children's Association. I've spoken on issues of governance, corruption, electoral reforms. Right now, I believe the thing I am called to talk about in this season is about philanthropy. And so I welcome you to join me as we have this conversation. Yes. Okay. So meanwhile, I was told I use. Yes. Okay. So. And I'd also like to have this as an interactive session. I hope that is okay. I don't know everything, and there are very many brains around this room at a university. So I'd like us to learn together. So I'm going to ask us to very quickly, Clement, if you pass those that side, just pick two each and pass down the, the line. Two, two each, pass down the line. Clement, some markers are here. Don't mind about the colors. They mean nothing. I know we are in Uganda. We'll start saying what? Storo, storo. But yeah. Uh, pick a marker. If they're not enough, we will share. And then I'm going to ask us to write something down. Does everybody have two sheets of paper? No? OK. And at least a marker nearby your neighbor. So does everybody have two sheets of paper? Yes? And a marker to share somewhere nearby in the vicinity. And I feel strange that there are screens, so... Yeah, I feel like I have to peep over people's... But yeah, so the, the question that we are going to answer is this. When you th uh, who do you think of when you hear the word philanthropist? Now, on each card, write one name. And it can be a name from anywhere in this world. Who do you think of when you hear the word philanthropist? Write one name per card. Who do you think of when you hear the word philanthropist? And if possible, try and write it on the long form of the horizontal. That's what it's called? Yes. 
rated this week. Clement and Ishban, you're going to be my assistants, so if you can if you can collect our answers. Who do you think of when you hear the word philanthropist? We will, we will come to that. I will come to that. I'm just coming at it from a certain angle. But I'm assuming we've ever heard of the word philanthropist. Yes? No? Really? OK. So we will, we, we will get to that point. But first, let's. Mark, help. I want to go to Second. blank. Huh? I want to go to blank screen for writing. Yeah. I told you those things are not in Kavali. Ah, here. Yes. So you want to write? Yes. Okay. And I want a blank screen. Is this? Yes. Okay. There's two over there. <coughs> so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read our answers and then we'll try and see if there is a common theme arising. And I hope I can read our handwriting. So, Mother Teresa, Nelson Mandela. Another one says, Mom. That is me, anyway, I'm a mother. Uh, another one said, Dona. This person's late father, John someone i'm going to murder this name if i try to say it that one uh rihanna scalabrim. yes john scalabrim aha uh, -huh. uh oprah winfrey bill poots i want us to hear the names and then we will start to joanne and joe persons Reverend Mugumia Duncan, Andrew Carnegie, Bill Gates. This one wrote Bill Gates twice on the same page. John Magufuli. Bill Gates, Jack M. A. Wonder who this is. Jack who? Oh, okay. Oh, he's a billionaire. Ah, see, I did not even know that one. Uh, Bill Gates, Nelson Mandela. It, no, it's twice. Somebody else had said Nelson Mandela. Um, Sarah Mann, another one said Phil, Mother Teresa, Bill High, Martin Luther King Jr., Bill Pult, president of the ghetto, of the nation, of the just president, Jesus, Mahatma Gandhi, 
And there's one I didn't read. There's one I didn't read. I put it down. I'm sorry, I haven't read your thing. Uh, okay, we'll get to it. So, what do you hear when you read? When, what do you hear as I said these names? What is most common to these names? Yes. Celebrities. Uh huh. Anything else? Uh, wealthy people. Wealthy people. Anything that was common? Yes. Freedom, Freedom fighters. People who speak for those who can't speak for themselves. Does that fall into the same category as freedom fighters or not really? Advocates. Okay. As, as broadly defined, not necessarily lawyers, right? Okay. Anything else? That, yes. People who have, and this category doesn't define any of them? Yes, no, maybe. Okay. Oh, give them back. Donors. Okay. Donors, what else did we hear? Yes. Social entrepreneurs, Social entrepreneurs and uh, Christians. Christians. Okay. Heroes. Heroes. Heroes from the dead. Heroes. Okay. So, non Ugandans. <laughs> Mostly, yes. <laughs> but in the majority, the majority were non Ugandans, right? That's right. Yes? Yeah. So, Remember the question was, when you hear the word philanthropist, who comes to mind? So what is a philanthropist? What is philanthropy? Uh, philanthropy is more like uplifting the well-being of people. Okay. Uplifting the well-being of people? The welfare. Okay. This one makes my hand right look ugly. Uplifting the well-being? Yeah, they say a poor woman blames the what? But I'm a work woman. So, yes. I think philanthropy is uh, the act of giving to those who do not have. The act of giving to those who do not have. Mm -hmm. We can take another. I think it's basically generosity and charity. And charity. Anybody else? Does that sort of define what we, um, when I was being introduced, he talked about philanthropy. Do we remember what he said, what Lauren said? Yes. I think it's those who stand in a gap for others. Those who stand in the gap for others. Okay. Like prayer warriors are philanthropists? Or rather intercessors? Those stand in the gap, right? Mark, your pen is dying. Okay, those who stand in the gap. So, if philanthropists are those that uplift the well-being of people, give to those who don't have, if it is those that are generous and those who stand in the gap, have any of us here ever done those things? Have any of you ever uplifted someone's well-being given to those who don't have, been generous to somebody, and stood in the gap for someone. 
Is that an experience we share? So did anyone write their name when I asked, when you think of a philanthropist? <laughs> so why, why don't we think of ourselves as philanthropists? If we say we have done all those things, yes. I, I think the names that have been forwarded are people that have, in, have intentionally mm -hmm. uh, put in place, um, they have put themselves in place to plan and uh, take it as something they want to do. Mm -hmm. to specifically give generously of what they have. So but when, when you say us, ah, mm -hmm. sometimes we will not actually plan, we just give when we are feeling pity or there's something like really pushing us to do this. Sometimes. Okay, he say he thinks there's a plan to it. You first must have planned, yes. And I'll come to you. I've seen your hand. Yes. I think when it comes to me, I would not uh, I didn't give out my name because it's not justifiable. Uh, like on the other side, it mm -hmm. is from me. And those are the names of people we have had at least being spoken and cited when it comes to uh, maybe giving back and improving the welfare of some other people. But you have given back and improved the welfare, okay, as me. Yes. The reason my name didn't come to mind when you asked about who we think about when the word philanthropy is said is because, is because from my exposure to the term, mm -hmm. it, seems, it seems it's people who have reached a specific net worth mm -hmm. who do all these things and it doesn't make a dent in their bank accounts. So they feel like, oh, I've achieved all my goals. I guess the next step is just to change to people's up. lives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's why my name didn't come up. Okay. But I, I think now I can say it. Okay. Uh, was there a hand this side before the? Yes, let's just finish. Again. Okay, and then you'll go that side. Uh, my name didn't come out because one thing. Oh, you forgot the spelling of your name? Or? No, anyway. no. <laughs> it's just because you can't blow your own trumpet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it's yours, so who would blow yours? <laughs> no, I can't speak for myself, so it's others to speak for me. Okay. Uh, there was the one or two hands this side. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, my name was not written, and as well as many of you, and because of these two reasons. One, mm -hmm. I want to believe that not every one of us knew the meaning of philanthropist. That's why maybe you didn't write your name. And two, doing, having all that done is not sufficient enough to become a philanthropist. Mm -hmm. I think there is something that must be added on to that. Which is? Rather, as we are going to share, we shall get to know that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> to add for us. I guess mine has already been said. Yes. I think the fact that I didn't write my name uh, is just because I wasn't even thinking about myself. So it's, it has something to do with uh, maybe selflessness. And um, I would rather, like my brother was saying, it should come from someone else. I shouldn't be the one blowing my own trumpet. Okay. But it's your, it doesn't blow my trumpet. Who, anyhow? Yes. So. One more? Yes, go ahead. Sorry, I hadn't I seen I think hand. when we think of fila, fila that one. Uh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's on a large scale. Mm -hmm. You do it on a large scale with big chunks of money, so someone like me or us, I don't think we've reached that extent. What is your name? I'm Ignatius. Ignatius. Yeah. Ignatius, without telling us how much money you have, do you think you have when juxtaposed with a much, much poorer person, don't you have a lot of money? I do. Because what is a lot of money? In uh, whose eyes? In um, the eyes of the richest man in the world. I think okay. on that scale. Okay. Okay. So it's very interesting. One of the things that CivSource is passionate about, and I didn't tell you about our organization, it is a non-profit consulting firm and what we do is give advisory services to philanthropists but we're also very interested in understanding 
local philanthropy and how it happens and what drives giving and what what is giving in the Ugandan or African context. So we, we are going along that road. And for those who were in the first conversation we had on this, we talked about how one of the things we want to do as Civ Source is try and enable people to see that philanthropy is a spectrum because giving happens along a continuum. We don't all have the same means, right? But we are all human and we all feel for another person. So while someone will take out a hundred million dollar check, the person who takes out a thousand shillings to pay for a person who can't afford a taxi ride is no less a giver. Isn't that it? You are all givers. When Lawrence was making the introduction, introduction, he said, philanthropy is the love of humanity. But somewhere along the way, philanthropy became how much money you have. And that, is, that was never the basis of philanthropy. The basis of philanthropy is love. So as long as I love another human enough to meet that human's need, I am a philanthropist. And I know that we also had a conversation about, yes, but is, that might be a word that's too big, and maybe it's for the ones who give the 100 million shilling, 100 million dollar check. And so we are also looking to how do you, how do we democratize the word so that all of us can see ourselves as philanthropists, And how do we create a narrative that in fact, in fact enables all of us to see ourselves as philanthropists? So that is one. The other question, and we are breaking these concepts down and we will bring them together. The title of my talk was Community Philanthropy as the Next Big Thing in Development Financing. So do we understand what philanthropy is? Are we clear on that? It is what? Love for humanity. It is not about how much money you have. Because in fact, if you think about Mother Teresa, 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 mm, uh, did she have a lot of money? But what was she doing in the slums of Calcutta? She was giving of her time, of her expertise, and she rallied around her communities of volunteers who were helping people in slums. Because I think we've also come to think of philanthropy only as money, as if to say giving can only be done through the currency of cash. But is that it? Is that necessarily so? So we also want to, in democratizing the word, it's to say it's a continuum and all of us can give and all of us have something to give. Even if it is helping an old lady cross the road and you're going to tell the taxi person stop so that you can help a child, you can help, that is, it is the love of humanity. It is not how much money you have in your bank account, of the excess of which you give. We talked about, um, I'm assuming, but I don't want to make assumptions, do all of us identify as Christian? I don't want to give an example that is not, does not resonate. Yes, no. Not saved, I've said Christian. No? None of us is Christian here. <laughs> You're a Christian, as if. Okay. So, the, the example I gave the last time we had this conversation was about the old woman who gave her last coin. And what did Jesus say of that woman? She has given the most. But in the world, who do we look at when we are measuring who has given the most? We're looking at the Bill Gates and all those other names I couldn't pronounce. Uh, Rihanna, Oprah Winfrey, because somehow we've made giving about an amount. And we've forgotten that giving is about the heart. Omutima Omugabi. A heart that gives. I guess 
giving cannot happen if the heart is not touched, is not moved to give, right? Because you will even then give the last blanket so that another person doesn't feel cold, right? So giving is about love, it's about the heart. So what is community? This one will take open hands. What is community? Yes. Community is society, the people in the society and the things going on in the society. Okay. You have a, I was just checking. Did you want to speak after? Okay. A community is a group of people who live together and they share a lot in common. Yeah. Okay. A group of people who live together and share a lot in common. Yes. The environment within us, including people and the race of the living things. Okay. There was a hand at the back. We all have to speak in the mic because it's being live streamed. So forgive the short delays that will cause. Yes. A community can be a social unit. Uh, within which people share something in common. Sorry, it can be a, I didn't hear. A social unit. Okay. Within which people share something in common. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll first take the, the lady in red. Uh, community is a group of people who live and work together. Who live and work together, okay. And then we'll take one, okay, two last ones. Yeah, a community which can as well be a society, I can define it as a relationship between the economic base and the superstructure, which of course is made by the people. Okay. I was going to say, can you please speak English, but yes. <laughs> Just telling you, yes. Okay, in addition to what they have said, I think the other words that are important in defining a community are coexistence mm -hmm. and togetherness. Yeah, so I thought that makes a community. Okay. So there's people and there's relationships. And, and commonality sometimes in community. Okay. And then... Just one last thing that I'll ask us to do very quickly in, can we group in fours very, very quickly, is then to define development. Among the four of you, just find any four people that you can sit together quickly with and define development. <laughs> Sandy, find your talent everywhere. <laughs> Lucas, where did you sing? What did I do? Why did you sing? What do you mean? Oh, oh, yeah, she did say. No, all her thinking is she's Jamie. You don't like red? I like red. But, uh... What do I do? We're going to agree a definition and write it on... I'll give you the economic definition. You will give us the humanitarian definition. The, the media definition, the law, the legal definition. Hello. Um, so the question is development. How do you define development? One, one, four people. Yes. So it's one blue card per four people because you're going to agree as the four what development is.
this is what happens now. When I see nothing, it just taps once. It will come this side. This goes to the next, this goes to the next. Just tap once. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, because uh, if I told you would go straight to power point, yeah. you tap this button. It doesn't have to be on. It doesn't have to be on. Are we done? Not yet. <laughs> I, and, and don't try to make it too academic. Just what is development as, as simply as you can put it. I'm giving us one more minute to write our definition. No, and each group will read their, their definition. You have to own your thing. <laughs> the views expressed will be those of viewers and Okay, so which group wants to go first? Yes. What is development? Our group de defined development as a positive progress or growth. Sorry, or I didn't hear the first words. Our group mm -hmm. defined development as positive progress or growth or improvement from one level or stage to another. Okay. Growth, improvement, one stage to another, yes. Okay, thank you so much. Is that mic working? I feel like I can't hear. It is, okay. So let's just raise our voices a bit. It's a bit low. Just, just go ahead, they just need to speak a bit louder. What is development? Again, let's, let's listen out for the words that are common. Yes. Our group divine development as qualitative and quantitative growth in all aspects of life. Those are mental, physical, economic, political, and social aspects. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, I see a hand at the back. That group has economists. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we yes. define development as growing or improving in various aspects, uh, be it spiritually, economically, and mentally. And we also agreed that it can be really small or really large. Okay, thank you. Each of us will have to speak, so just yeah, raise your hand when the next group is over. Yes. As a group, we define development as a quality of positive growth, economically, socially, and physically. Okay. As a group, we define development as a gradual as a gradual trans, uh, qualitative and quantitative transformation of a particular from one level to another, irrespective of either social, economic, or political. <laughs> okay, 
Thank you. Yes. We define development as the progress towards well-being of society. The progress towards well-being of society. Okay, there's a. Okay, uh, there's one there, and then. Yeah. Sure. Uh, precisely, we define development as a shift from any given status to a higher one in all aspects of life. Okay. We defined development as a gradual positive change in a community in all aspects. Okay. Thank you. So what words struck you as common as we read our definitions? Positive. So, there's, so if there's regression, that is not development. Development is forward, is positive, yes. And what else? Growth. Mm -hmm. Pardon? She says quantitative. Okay. Quantitative, quantitative. is help those of us who went to UPE schools. Mass. In terms of number? Numbers. Ah, okay. okay. So a positive shift or growth for a numbers. large section. Then the quality, the qualitative, which comes with the how better are you developing, are you improving? Okay. Yeah. And it's a gradual process. It doesn't happen overnight. I don't come and develop you and you're developed like... I found you sick today and tomorrow you're better and okay so it's it's gradual meaning i suppose that there will be some times it goes back up like two steps back but one step forward because we're dealing with humans right and humans don't always change at the same pace some will resist change some will so anything else that we had that was common people power <laughs> no sorry i'm what did you you said power no. oh <laughs> Aspects. Okay, I will believe you. Since you have said that's what you said. Community aspects. Okay. Any one last word that was common as we said our definitions? So I think we generally have an idea, right? So when we try and put the three big things together community philanthropy for development. What does that look like for you? Remember, we defined what philanthropy is, we defined community, and now we define development. And what we are saying this afternoon is that community philanthropy leads to, contributes to development. Do we think that is true? You're sure? Okay. So we will build the case slowly. Can one of us read this? Can you all see this? Can one of us read it, please? communities, rather than depending only on what comes from the outside. Okay, sorry, read it again. Um, what is com so that it flows like a, a sentence, sorry. What is community philanthropy? Mm -hmm. Locally owned development because it builds an asset that already exists within communities rather than depending only on what comes from outside. Okay, so what are the key words? It's locally owned. Oh, sorry, they said my thing will. I'm sorry about that. It's locally owned. It builds on assets that already exist within communities rather than depending only on what comes from outside. But when we think about how development is defined or done in our country, it seems as though this is the only part that's happening depending on what comes from outside. Isn't that the general feeling? That we need others to help us. That's how you get government, etuyambe, abanachewa batuyambe. And yet, locally, community philanthropy is 
about building on assets that already exist. So it's not only one side, it is both sides coming together. Right? Are we clear? I'll, I'll come back to that later. And so we wanted to describe for you a few of those instances that it happens. And I'm sure there are many stories among us about community philanthropy in action. I'll ask Eshban to tell us the story of this trench. Hi, guys. Or oh, you need the microphone so that they can, yeah. OK. Um, so this is a very simple story. Um, so in southwest Uganda, there's a district called Kanungu, which I'm sure some of us know. So Kanungu is located between two national parks. On one side is Queen Elizabeth Park, which is famous for the tree climbing lands. And on the other side is a, Queen El is a Buwind Impenetrable uh, Forest, which is famous for the tree climbing, um, not tree climbing, for the mountain gorillas. So um, in Queen Elizabeth, in, in the, at the Queen Elizabeth Park, the community residents. It's on. Yeah, so the community residents of a village called Bukore had a problem. The elephants in the national park, Queen Elizabeth, would cross over into the human settlements to, um, f to hunt food, but they would cross over into human settlements and they would destroy gardens and in some cases they would destroy small houses because you know, there are no proper gardens and watermelon and, uh, watermelon and fruits in the national parks. So the elephants would move over to the human settlements looking for food, but in the process, they would destroy a lot of property. So the people in this village called Bukore, which is somewhere in Kanungu, had a very simple option. The first one was to kill the elephants, but they didn't do that. What they did, they decided uh, amongst themselves to approach government to fix this issue. So the government told them that they were going to procure a group of trees called, uh, in, I, I, I don't know what these trees are called in English, but in the local language they call them mukonwe. So they are very, very hard trees, but also very, very flammable. So the government suggested to them that they would plant a line of those trees, which would then form a fence or a boundary between the human settlements and the national parks. But the residents refused because they, they were afraid that these trees were very flammable. So after months and months of waiting for government to do something about it and nothing happening, they decided on their own that they were going to dig a trench, and there's a picture of the trench here, that was so deep and so wide that it, could, that it would create a boundary between the village and the national parks. So what they did, they, they dug a trench that was five meters deep and about one and a half meters wide. But when the elephants, you know, wanted to cross over, they realized that a boundary had been created. Now, during the process of digging this trench, uh, the, 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 the residents left heaps of soil right, at the, right next to the trench, or at the top of the trench. So what the elephants did is that they started to uh, kick the soil back into the trench to fill it so that they could access the other side of the, 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 uh, the other side of the community. So the community residents started to get frustrated, but what they did is they made a plan they would meet every Wednesday to dig the trench deeper from, four, from five meters to seven meters and to make it even wider. So they gave equipment, spades, wheelbarrows, money, uh, Bushera, because you know when you're doing that kind of labor work, you get tired. So they decided amongst themselves to collect whatever resources that they had to build this boundary that would separate the national park and the community. In the end, it took them up to about six years, but they dug a trench that was seven feet deep, one and a half meters wide, and it was seven, it is seven kilometers long. Now, I don't know if any of you really like can perceive yeah. how long a kilometer is. So this picture might not show it really well, but the trench goes all the way. All that is the trench. And it stops at the Uganda-Congo border. The only thing that stopped this, this community was an international boundary. And on the other side, the Congolese government 
built um, an, an iron fence, you know, to keep the elephants away from the human settlements. So it took them, we, we don't, re, we, we, because the, the community did not keep record of how much they spent while building this, this elephant trench, we know from engineers that if government had hired people to do this kind of work, you would need an excavator. It's, I think that it's called an excavator. It's, you know, it looks like a huge caterpillar-like tractor which goes, digs, and puts it out. Now, the cheapest excavator that you can find is you would hire it at 1.5 million shillings per day. And in a day, if the, depending on the speed that the person is working at, because you know, some of them are really slow, because the slower they work, the more they get paid they might dig up to about 100 meters, meaning it would take them 10 days to dig a kilometer. It would then take them 70 days, no, is it? No, 10 days, yeah, 70 days to dig seven kilometers. Can someone help me with the math? 1.5, yeah, time was 70. Yeah. Yeah, so that's 105 million. I mean, like, if you decided to do it on your own. But if you hired a construction company to do this job, they would not charge you less than 700 million. So uh, the point of this story is to show that a community can get together and solve a serious infrastructure problem that would have required a lot of money for government to fix. So going back to what we were discussing, community philanthropy, do we see it in action? Have we understood how a community using locally available assets, manpower, bushera, hose, I mean people contributing what they have to fix a problem? Is in that development? Yes, no? Okay. Uh, the other story that we found amazing, we visited a place called, is it Matanda Mutanda? Now I don't remember, but it is in uh, Kisoro, near the lake. The lake is Mutanda. Yes, so forgive our typo. We visited this young man who grows mushrooms. This young man is very passionate about child education. And he was very concerned that children in that village that is on the shores of Lake Mutanda were not going to school. Actually, what we don't have a picture of, the community came together and actually built a school. So they solved problem A. At the same time, of course, the school needs paper, it needs teachers, it needs so the little money they could collect from school fees was going to pay for the school to be able to run. Did that mean all children could access the school? Unfortunately, no. So this young man whose mushroom project we visited said he thought of what he could do. And he wanted to use his hands. He didn't have a lot of money. He wanted to use his hands as a way to contribute to some children going to school because he said he knows the power and benefit he got from education, the power of education and the benefit that he got. And he looked around, wondered what could he do, and then he heard that in Kavale town, there was a group that was training youth on mushroom growing. And so he paid for himself, drove a bus to Kavale, and attended a seven-day training on mushroom growing. So he came back and talked to the elders in the community, who gave him a piece of land on which he grows mushrooms. And through this mushroom growing, he's able to pay for five children to go to school. Does that seem like a lot? Maybe not. But he is solving part of a problem of the community, enabling these children to go to school. What he does when the children are in the holiday he brings them to the mushroom project so that they can help him fetch water, 
he's also passing on a skill so that maybe one day they too can have a project that helps their community. So that is another one. And this is literally because the community gave him the land and because they, they knew what he wanted to do to help solve a community problem. So that's why we think, or we are starting to think, that community philanthropy is very key for development. The challenge is that when we talk about development, and especially Africa, I think we only hear one side of the story. And which side of the story do we hear? Which side of the development story do we hear? The money side, the side that it is others who are developing us, right? I think in the story that Eshban told in Kanungu, one of the, um, why am I speaking back to myself? One of, the, one of the conservation societies also added some money but really it was mostly the community effort. However, of course, as a conservation society, I have a newsletter. And what, will, what story will I tell? Will I tell theirs or will I tell mine? Whose story will I tell? So who blows whose trumpet? So if we are not blowing our trumpet, no one is blowing it for us, right? If we are not telling the stories of communities stepping in to develop their communities. We will only hear one side of the story. And we'll usually the, hear the side of the story, and no offense to my brothers in the room, of a Western white giver coming to develop us. Does that negate what they do? No. It's just that that is not the only story. OK? That's all we are saying. It's not the only story about giving. We also give every day all our lives to various community causes. I want to show us a brief video. Mark, I do what? This one. And then, yes, please help me because this will take five minutes. It's also more stories that we collected as civ source around the question of community philanthropy. So we don't have to in this In the 1970s, this uh, area was a dangerous place. Some of the children, my mother realized, were growing up in a horrible, horrible environment to bring up a child. There were broken families, half families, uh, families where parents are in prison and stuff like that. So they didn't have uh, an ideal upbringing. So she sought to put here a, a school that is based on the foundations of Christianity. You know, in Uganda here, uh, uh, we the youth, we face a lot of challenges. Because if we talk about drug abuse, it's one of the biggest problems that we are facing here in Uganda, mostly with the youth. I was once a victim, and if, if, if I can use my, uh, my testimony to change, other peop to change other people, then let me do that, so that at least I save um, my fellow youth from using drugs and aviation fuel uh, as well. I came to the hospital um, to see a patient. And because I love music too much, I had, and I love dance, I, you know, music was being played in one of the wards. And I figured if they let them listen to music that loud especially, they might let them dance. So I went out on a whim, I wrote a letter to the administration asking to dance with the alcohol and drugs unit patients because I figured they pick up their vices from clubs they listen to this music, they love to dance, so they will appreciate what I do more. And I have been dancing at Butavika Hospital for two years. When we started, of course, we were, I was genuinely afraid. But midway through the class, I realized that first of all, the class was charged with like a different special energy. We had such a great time that by the end of the class, 
we were high-fiving, hugging each other, taking selfies. I mean, there was no boundaries. It didn't matter who they were, what they looked like, what they were suffering from, nothing. We were just all on the same high. And I realized that, wow, this music and dancing and everything really puts us all at the same level. Once we have danced, we are one and we are the same. All our inhibitions, all our fears and everything dissolve at that point. In this community, the mothers that we have are single. Uh, it's hard for most of them. Uh, the foundation at least is uh, helping to, to pay for a few kids. We have, the foundation has about 300 kids, uh, but so far like 20 are going to school. So we identify these mothers and we support them where we can. There was this girl that had come from uh, one of the countries in the region and had been told the sex trade is booming in Uganda and she came to Uganda, uh, made some unfortunate situations, she was thrown out of a moving car, dragged on the tarmac and I think she was one of the girls who first responded to it. So we just came in, I think we responded as mums. We just came in with all the passion and uh, brought food, clothing, provided care. Um, she was taken away but a seed had been planted in our hearts and we felt these are the girls we want to look out for, these are the girls we want to respond to. We didn't even know what that looked like, but shortly after that we were introduced to a pastor who was reaching out to the girls. He would go out at night, go out during the day. Um, he had a church uh, in Katanga and so we started by just going there and taking food and clothing and very quickly we identified needs that the young girls needed. Uh, a place to stay, a shelter, a place better than just the, what he was able to provide for them and afford. We started that dance group, Splash, and uh, we were performing, we were, we were going to schools to inspire, having motivation, speaking, you know. Those, those young kids really go through a lot of challenges in schools, that's why they, you see the dropout, the dropout number is really big. So we decided to do that to to really find a solution. And um, one thing I've loved uh, about like this dust industry, it's, it's the only industry that has given uh, everyone a chance actually. Because no matter how, you know we have different disabilities. Uh, the way I do dancing, it's not the way someone with autism is, not, is going to do it. It's not the way someone with uh, cerebral palsy but they, this dance gives you an option that everyone can use their unique body to communicate. And this is dancing. So we see the, the different ways that communities can give, right? Yes? So I hope I'm building a case. We started def by defining who we think a philanthropist is. And we talked about what philanthropy is, what community is, and what development is. And I hope you see the thread through that any of us, in fact all of us, right, are philanthropists in our own right, yes? Because we've all given to someone in need at some point. We are all part of various communities. And when we come together as communities to solve a community problem, we are aiding the development chain. And it doesn't have to be money only. People have given dance, people have given school fees, people have given blankets, people have opened their homes and sheltered runaway girls. People have, it's all kinds of things as long as it is in the aid of another human being. Why do you think, should I ask why before I say, do you think community philanthropy is the way to go? Why do you think it would be viable to concentrate or to put our focus and energy on community philanthropy as the best way to do development? Are we crazy to think like that? What do you think? 
Yes. D okay, microphone. What is your name, sir? Mm Kenneth, okay, thank you. Thank you for helping. Yes. Thank you very much. I think community philanthropy would be the best way to bring about development because you use what you have, not necessarily what you do not have. Use what is available in the community to empower every other person. And in so doing, you're able to maximize the resources that are available, human resource, material resource, etc. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, let me first see all the hands, then I'll get a, a yeah, even yours. Okay, yes. No, go ahead. Uh, initially, I come from a place where NGOs have been operating. But is the mic on? Oh, okay. I come from a place where NGOs have been operating for the last 60 years, and initially, and these NGOs, their projects have never been successful. It has, their projects have never impacted the lives of the community members. So I believe the number one reason is because the community do not own the processes where these policies are, desi are designed from. And I believe once they, they start doing it within amongst themselves, they will own it and they actively participate and ensure that it impacts on them. Okay, thank you. I had seen another, there was a lady behind who I saw before I saw this gentleman. Sorry, and I don't know your name, so my apologies that I'll call you ladies and gentlemen. Yes. It's okay. My name is Pauline in case this happens again. Um, so w from our discussion about philanthropy, I have drawn, I've come to a conclusion that maybe the initial sense of what a government should do is philanthropy. The, the whole point is we would have all these problems and we'd have a representative who is going to go and fight for our rights and using our own resources that we've sent, for, sent to the government, they would bring them back and then we properly allocate them to the solutions that we want. Mm -hmm. But the sense of philanthropy has been lost by the people leading us and this is a problem that we are facing worldwide. So when we now draw back to the concept of community philanthropy, I guess people are like, you know what, we can't wait anymore. And development in whatever sense it comes in, how long it will come for as long as it's community initiative and community led and it is honest and true, then that is something that we can look forward to. I think community philanthropy is something that we should all adopt in our personal lives. We don't even have to wait for an entire meeting to be held. I think we should just take a step in that direction and little by little the, the brick will be, sorry, the wall will be built brick by brick, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes, sir. There was a, a gentleman here. Sorry, sorry to point. Yes. Well, I'm called Sandy and uh, when, we, when, when you talk about community philanthropy, yeah, it's the best way to go for now because it really, according to me, it involves almost uh, less of the bureaucracies which we have really observed in the current uh, leaders that people are much attached to the power and the title that he or she has to attach a signature for you to proceed further but when it comes to uh, community progression you really need to mobilize the people who are around and then something can be done as long as it is and it's positive thank you thank you uh, let's move to this side of the room slowly. I see the a gentleman in a white shirt. Well, thank you. My name is Brian. Um, I want to first start by admitting that when we, before we started this discussion, my idea of philanthropy was very different. And when we wrote the names there, one of the names I wrote, or the name I wrote, is uh, Bill Poulter. My idea of philanthropy was that someone with a lot of money disposes it of. And I've come to learn that it may not be money, you know, resources, helping out those that are disadvantaged in the community. And I've come to think of, you know, a lot of charity organizations that come from outside Uganda. For instance, we have people who come, people who sit down and uh, identify specific areas. For example, this, the, the CA community and they be like, you know what, let us go and help schools, let us take books, let us take clothing, 
and they identify specific things. But let us imagine community philanthropy, where a, a community sits down and you know, says, we have a lot of challenges, we, are, we have a lot of things going on. How do we help ourselves? Let us sit as a community and build schools. Let us sit as a, as a community and help you know, single mothers. Let us sit as a community and build hospitals. So I think that is the way to go because a community better knows the challenges that they, they go through. Someone else sits from outside and identifies just one thing and comes and focuses on that. So what happens to the, the other things that are not looked at by, by those persons? Mm -hmm. So I think, uh, yeah, community philanthropy is the way to go. Okay, thank yeah. you. <coughs> thank you so much. My name is Mutundi Oris, and I think community philanthropy is the way to go. Why? Uh, me, I believe that development is not all about the facilities you have, but having the real people who are willing to work together for a common good. And I think this kind of work, it raises a social responsibility through that social contract made by the people. Once you believe in yourselves, you can be able to push yourselves somewhere. So I believe that uh, if you work together as a community, however much the resources are not all that much, but you can be able to go far. Uh, as you well know that uh, great people or great societies did not start as great, but uh, her being with an extraordinary determination. So if you, your, determina your determination is extraordinary, you can be able to come out. And another issue is mm, there is no person that will come to think rightly the problem you have in your house. Because they say that the value of something is seen through the eyes of the owner. So, like uh, the, 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 what you showed us of Kanungu, I think the people were really feeling what they were going through. The government, yes, it might have seen it as a problem, but as of the moment, they didn't have it on the program. And, the, and yet people were suffering. So me personally, I believe it's the way to go. And I call upon everyone around to every community you come from, that's the way to go. Okay. Yeah, still, I add my voice as a patriot. Thank you. Yes. Um, I'm Edwin Maseruka. We don't hear, my dear. I'm Edwin Maseruka. OK. I think community and philanthropy is overwhelmingly the way to go. It is perfect. In a way that, if you look at the example of, of Kanungu, those people had to wait for government to help them. There is a protocol you're supposed to follow. Mm -hmm. But if this issue is going to be addressed by the community, there is no protocol. And mm -hmm. in case, let's say the government decides to help, is an issue of corruption, which, which will be a setback. So I think this is so perfect, because it requires no protocol. OK. Thank you. There was a hand at the back, and then, OK, show okay. the mic. Yes. Um, community philanthropy. I feel like this is a concept that uh, already exists, mm -hmm. because we see it in, um, in maybe youth groups that they form in different communities or like maybe churches deciding to reach out to the people around them and something like that. And I think it's important to not entirely consider it as a, a whole new concept, yes. but it's true that mm -hmm. the other side of the story is being told much more. And magnifying this is an important aspect in promoting it. And I feel like um, as Africans, we take a lot of things for granted. The small things, for example, being good at telling stories or writing or dancing. And these are things that can transform people at different levels. And I think it's important because it, it creates a whole magnitude of what you can bring to the table. And anyone is able to bring something to the table for development. Yeah. Thank you. There was a hand in the front. Is that OK? And then we will go ahead. I am also mindful I don't want to keep us too long. Yes. I think 
community front rope is a way to go because you see people are the one participating and they always give protection to what they are doing and be mindful always. Like for example, I saw that video of Kanungu, people after digging over five meters deep and those elephants trying to push back the soil, they always went back. But with the government, we always think like, ah, we provided something. If they didn't mind, we're not going back to work upon it. But people always think about their thing. They support it and always give it protection. Thank you. Okay. So I, I also want to make one thing clear, right? That the issue here is not that there is one way to do development. Right? There is a role that government must play because we pay our taxes so that they can be fairly distributed across the country for social services. There is a role that development partners play, there is a role that NGOs play, and there is a role for communities. The point is, I think the community participation and contribution in development is little seen and hardly recognized. If we hear next year the speech of the Minister of Finance, whoever it will be, he will talk about, or she, how many taxes have been raised to revenue, how many, even our giving is not recognized nationally. And that is a policy issue. Because I think a government that thinks about and recognizes and names and celebrates giving will quantify it so that it shows that we all contribute to our development. It is not them versus us. It is not outsiders doing for us. It is all of us because all of us are human and all of us want a better life. So that, please, you can clap. I, 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 <laughs> I saw people doing. <laughs> Oh, God, oh, no, you can give me. Yeah, so, so that, that is the point. It is not to negate the other forms, but I think the other forms have had more airtime than communities. And I think community philanthropy, community giving, has not been elevated to the same level. Because again, we think those who give more are to be celebrated more. But giving happens whether I give my blanket or whether you give you $100 million. It is all giving, because we all want another human to be better. So, imagine with us, how many villages are there in Uganda? <laughs> it's not a number. <laughs> You're trying to think. Okay, I think as that last count, if we can trust our statistics, it was about 60,000 villages. Now imagine, and I'm, I'm merely guessing, right? We're merely guessing because we don't yet know the actual data. Imagine that probably within each village there are at least three community projects going on of about a million shillings. And I'm just using a million as it could be 500 million, it could be who knows. Let's say a million. So what is 60,000 times three projects times a million shillings? Who can calculate that for us? 60,000 villages times three projects per village, community projects, times a million shillings per project. What is the figure that we get? How, how much? 1.8 trillion. And we are merely guessing, right? So imagine with me, because we said communities are different. Imagine with me, the number of churches across this country doing community projects, building schools, building hospitals, doing medical camps. Imagine that and multiply. Imagine with me the number of Rotary Clubs across this country times the number of projects that they do times the number of people they reach. 
Imagine with me alumni associations. I'm, I, I am part of GOGA, Gaza Old Girls Association, and there are many alumni associations across this country giving back to their schools, right? What other communities are there? Imagine with me, lawyers trying to build a center. We had um, one of the stories that we profile on our website is a lawyer who, on his birthday, instead of receiving gifts, asked people to contribute money. And the money that was contributed, he took to Njeru prison, I believe. So imagine with me the number of lawyers. What other communities? Imagine with me. So can you see how much we are contributing to development? Can you imagine that figure? But we don't even know it. And part of the reason we don't know it is, one, we don't see it, we don't tell it. We don't see it, we don't tell it. But imagine with me. So how much, and moreover, I've counted money projects. We haven't counted people volunteering time, people giving their clothes and shoes, people giving their homes to, we haven't counted all of that. But imagine we counted all the ways that communities are giving to support each other to be better. Can you begin to imagine what that figure looks like? That is the story we want to tell. Because we believe when we, communities are changing lives, we're just not telling the story enough if it's being told. And so, if you do not mind, I keep forgetting that I have to use this. But can you imagine, are you, are you guys as blown away as we are? Like seriously, this is mind blowing stuff. Just imagine how much giving, how much development is happening in community every day in this country. And so, we would like to ask you to join us in this journey of telling the stories. Because Eshban and I and the few people that we are at Seal Source won't be able to. We need to blow this trumpet. And it is our trumpet to blow. We need to own the trumpet that we blow. We're soon breaking off for the Christmas holiday, yes? Yes or no? Yes. Okay. So do you mind if I give you homework? Do they call it homework at university? I don't remember. Take what? Take home. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to give you a take home. As you go, wherever you will be at Christmas, try and look out for, ask around about a community project, a community philanthropy, a way that the community that you'll be in is giving. And we'd like you to write that story. If you can't write it, take a video, but describe it as you're doing the video. We want to tell these stories. We want to be able to, one of the things that we are building is a data, what do you call it? Giving tracker. Giving tracker because we want to track the many ways that Ugandans are giving all across this country so that you can pinpoint to a place and be able to see all the giving that's happening. Wouldn't that be beautiful? But we can't do it ourselves. So please, and if you do, we would like to use your story, if you don't mind, on our website. We really want to tell and celebrate the ways that Ugandans are doing, are giving. Can you do that with us? Yes. Are you sure you will? You can try or you will do. Which one? <laughs> you can try or you will do. Because why? Can someone read that for us? Until lions have their own historian tells of hunt, will always glorify the hunters, African proverb. Wanji, how did you read that? Until lions have their own historians, tales of hunt will always glorify the hunters. Okay. 
And the hunters only see their side of the story, right? They will never see your side of the story. And that's the side we want to tell. Because development doesn't happen only one way by only a certain group of people. It happens all day, every day around us. We just have to open our eyes and see it and then tell those stories. So please tell those stories with us so that we can tell the story of how Ugandans are participating in their own development every day that we live. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you so much, Madam Asimwe Jacqueline. Um, you know, when you, you talked about us imagining, and I started imagining, and I'm actually having headaches, so I don't know how many figures those are in terms of expressing or converting the, the, the level of imagination. Um, we are going to buy some time. Our tea is yet to be set. But we're going to ask three questions. Three questions. Please be precise and concise. And I wanted to give us the... I'm really serious about getting stories. I hope that in a room of how many are we? We are 38. 38. That we will at least get 37 stories. Is that a good deal? So who will be that one? I'm, I'm going to... <laughs> Kerement possible. Oh um, I'm going to give you the email of Eshban so that you can send these stories to him. You can go ahead and ask the questions. Questions, please. Yes, Madam President. Thank you very much. So my, my question has to do with the governance of the community. There are situations where the people in the community have tried to take matters into their own hands and there is opposition from political leaders or, yeah, basically com political leaders. So what can an individual who wants to go out into the community and do something that will positively impact on the community, do about such kind of opposition. Does anyone have an answer? Thank you. Because yeah, we, are, we are many brains in this room. What do you think? She said that, and, and it's not, don't even think that it happens just in the villages. I stay in Namwongo and Several years ago, the Monitor Publications and various other businesses along that strip of road wanted to do the road because it was a very, very bad road. And they said, we don't even want money. We will collect money amongst ourselves as the businesses that use this road, and we will tarmac the road. And there was back and forth and haggling and no and yes, maybe partly because they assumed you are an open, you know, there was all that. And so, they just, they waited and kept asking. And one day, because government knew they were anyway, maybe not ever going to do that road, they allowed them. So that's part of it. So I, again, don't assume that it only happens in some faraway villages. No, this was right here in the middle of town. And these are people asking to tarmac a road that they use. They're not even asking for money for it. And it was denied severally, but they kept pushing. And, and I also don't want us to look at this as though I am going to help. No. First of all, it is seeing what our community is already doing. And can we tell that story before we start inserting ourselves as helpers? And it's not, I'm not even saying it's bad to help, but it's first opening our eyes to what is already happening so that that is what we first tell. But also, and then how can I participate with my community? And we said there are various communities that we belong to and various ways that we can give. But it's first to even just open our eyes. So I think for me the issue would be persistence. And if we can, because we're educated, and sometimes it is what it is, they'll respect you, an educated person, more than another. I had the unfortunate situation recently one of my gym instructors just wanted to change his ID card. 
because they got his names wrong on his national, uh, uh, na national ID. But every time he went, I guess because they look at you and figure, uh, we shall serve you when we get to you. And so he said, can you help me? So I asked a colleague who is a lawyer, he was always dressed in suits, because I knew, unfortunately, that he will be regarded higher, better than this guy who can't dress as well. And so he, he escorted him. That was all this required. Just come with me to the office and, I will get, and it happened. So it's, sometimes our education can access us places that a community may not. Maybe it is a project that they need to write. Maybe it is a certain, you know, whatever it is, we can always see how to. But yeah, you, yes, we will bump against development because it's not an easy road, right? And sometimes people want to take all the credit. And so they block communities doing their thing. But persistence and insistence. So I think the mic is behind there. We shall come to the front. Yes. Thank you so much. For me, my major concern is uh, the capitalism aspect in this whole thing. Mm -hmm. You realize us as uh, Africans, that our origin was we supported each other, we lived with each other, and that's how communities were developing. But now when the money aspect came in, it brought the materialism, and people are rewarding materialism. So it is how much we have, which has cropped into the individualism aspect of it, and people are thinking of their own. Uh, now when we are looking at this, how much of this growing capitalism syndrome is going to affect this? Especially, this was our format originally, and somehow it overshadowed it. How much are we doing and how are we ready to suppress the capitalism perspective so that we strike a balance to see the money aspect is there, but whereas also the communities are now thinking of working together more. Thank you. Who is answering that one? You're answering? Okay, go ahead. Um, the whole bit of capitalism. I, why? Okay. Uh, we are in a growing and changing society, I would say. And most of, okay, I'm sorry, but for our fellow Western cultures that have invaded into our community and society, we have tended to, should I say copy? Yes. We have, um, okay, now if we are to go way back in uh, history, we, when they came into Africa, uh, okay, how should I say it? Um, in Uganda, they used indirect rule, you know, who we were being carried by the chiefs, mainly the, the Buganda chiefs. So in this, they, they would maybe say uh, dressing, you would uh, wear a suit, maybe a dress with a hat, okay, all that. So in all that, we kept on picking a few things. Because let's, we can't say it's assimilation, like how they, let's say they forced onto us. No, we weren't forced. But w we copied because we saw they looked so much better than us and we wanted to go towards that end. So um, the government of Uganda has put us in a position whereby they want us to be like them, but we are not them. And people are forgetting that what they want is for themselves. I'm going to get money for myself and my family, full stop. I'm not going to care about, let's say, father relatives or people around me. It's like the way you're going to go to a Kololo or Nakasero, and those people are in their gates. You won't get to know your neighbor. You know, people are selfish. Then uh, when they want to give, let's say, out, they're going to fundraise, but in expensive dinners. You know, they won't say... Uh, Let's go to maybe Nakasongola or to Chinawataka and, you know, come in as a community and let's say clean or provide clothes to the orphans. So uh, capitalism starts with the leaders. People are selfish, honestly. 
Recently, the Buganda, sorry, the Land Board Search Commission, and these guys found out that grabbing was in the rural areas where they wouldn't get to find them. So you grab land from a poor person who has nothing, and you wouldn't have anything to say, let's compensate or what. So people copy from their leaders. So that's how capitalism comes about. You go, copy from your leader. Your leader is stealing money, greedy, what? Uh, they provide medicine to the, to the people. They'll end up stealing it and selling it to other countries in maybe Congo or Rwanda or Tanzania and to get money for themselves. So I believe that it's just about a common understanding. If the leaders would show a good example to their fellow people, you know, then yeah, I don't think uh, capitalism would be that much of an issue. Okay. You want to answer or you have another question? Okay. You have an answer, okay. Can we give to the lady with an answer? And we'll come to your question. Um, talking about how unfair the leaders that we currently have are, um, honestly speaking, I feel like that's a gone case. So I feel like it's important to realize at what point we need to instill these values to sort of eradicate the capitalistic, selfish idea for self-interest of people. And I feel like places like schools, churches are a good place to start because you are now preparing for like future generations. So I think it's really important to identify those places and start from there because then we are going to have people who are better coming out and changing the society. Is that an answer or a question? An answer as if question, what? <laughs> I will hear, yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. In general, about uh, philanthropy um, and what you're doing, I think it is a commendable job. And just hearing the responses and questions, I, I do think that um, th this is a powerful message that should not just be shared in such a setting, uh, but I think it is a kind of message that uh, the whole nation needs to hear and I really hope that there are ways in which you are able to uh, you know share this message across our nation um, and uh, I wouldn't say that government is a good case I think government usually derives from us and this is really an issue of ideology that gov people in government have a certain ideology which is taught in the same schools that we are going to. And so it is really not uh, a good thing to think that we can just give up on government. And I'm just saying that just like there is need for the Wanainchi to hear this message, I think government needs to hear this message as well. So maybe there is need to invest a little in engaging government on the issues of philanthropy, community philanthropy, that they can revise policy to account for what communities can do, and if possible, support communities in what they're doing. Instead of taxing uh, workers so heavily, because currently uh, someone who is working is taxed almost 40% of their income, maybe they should cut down on the taxation and empower the communities mm -hmm. to be able to do some things for themselves. And so for me, I think it is really an issue of the way government thinks and if they can be helped to, re to rethink, uh, to have a different perspective, then maybe this will work for us all. Okay. I think one thing I will offer, are you, is that an answer or a, a, bit a bit of a reaction? She can react a bit. Um, I think we all, we all are aware of how our government has failed us in so many ways. And that is where we are having these discussions. That is where we are beginning to talk about things like this because we have appreciated that, okay, maybe it will never happen that the leaders that we vote every four years are going to step in for us. 
And maybe like the system of politics and democracy is failing us, so why not return to us, uh, ourselves as individuals? I do not think in any way, I honestly do not think in any way that we can have discussions with the government or that we are, or that we can appeal to them in any way to change the way they have chosen to lead us. So if we could just step aside from that narrative and choose our own stories and choose the way we want things to go, irrespective of whatever is happening in the politi political world, because we have no control over that. Whether we like it or not, it's something that is beyond our power and we, ha we cannot direct it in any way, but community philanthropy is something that we can direct. It's something that can begin with us in small groups, in big groups, in classes, in schools, in churches, in health centers, because we find brotherhood in the people or sisterhood, familyhood, in the people that we end up spending a lot of time with. And unfortunately, these people are not our leaders. These people don't get to hear our stories. These leaders, sorry. So these people who we have a kinship with, that's the correct term to use, kinship. Who we have a kinship with, they know our backgrounds and we know theirs. And we understand each other's hustle, if I can put it like that. So if we could just, let's leave the government out of this. Otherwise, if they were coming through, we'd not even be having this discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so what, let me clarify, if I'm still on, let me clarify two things. That, remember we said that development doesn't happen one way. It's easy for a government to come and tell you that, Without them, we would be nothing. It's easy for donors to come and tell us without them, we'd be nothing. All we are saying is that it is a spectrum and all of us contribute. The main story we have heard is when those outside of our community, whether it's government or other ones, that's the side of the story that we hear. What I'm inviting us to think about and open our eyes to is the ways communities are there for each other. If you want to remove the capital equation, but money does help, let's also then open our eyes and look for and tell the stories where that celebrate giving that is non-monetary. And I'm sure there are many. And I'm also sure that giving happens both ways. We give of our time, of our labor, of our ideas, of our money, of our, it happens, it's, it's giving happens in multiple ways. What gets recognized, known and celebrated is giving that's attached, that has a monetary value. So let's open our eyes to the ways communities are giving, whether monetary or non-monetary. The other thing is that Remember that even as communities are meeting their needs in various ways, ways that we are going to look for and showcase, we also pay tax because we are citizens of a certain country. And I don't want us to walk out of here thinking we can't do anything. Otherwise, what is a policy lab for? The fact that we have government means that there are people that have, we've handed a responsibility. And part of that responsibility is development. And that while we are looking out for telling and celebrating the ways communities are there for each other, we are also demanding of government the responsibility around how they use our tax, around how they treat those that are corrupt. We are not leaving that conversation because if we leave that, it will get much worse. So we must be responsible citizens at both ends recognizing and celebrating and showcasing the ways communities are there for each other, but also equally demanding with as much vigor that it's, they do right by us. And I also don't want to assume that leadership only happens via government through politics. Any of us are leaders. And that's why communities take things into their hands, because at that level they're exercising that leadership. I will not wait for another we will solve our problems together with the means that we have. We'll try and go as far as we can 
so that we help each other. So it's, it's please hear both things, right? It's not just one way, it's just that one certain way has been told more than what communities are doing. And what we want to do is celebrate and tell and have the policy conversation about how, what would it look like to acknowledge, just begin with acknowledging, even before you contribute to community development. Just begin by acknowledging how much communities are contributing to their development. And once we can aggregate that in the number of stories, times the number of villages, times that, that's why it's giving us all, imagine all the ways we are doing community and giving. Acknowledge that. And once you acknowledge that, have a policy conversation about, so how do we enhance it? How do we support it? Is it by tax relief? Is it by what ways can we support and acknowledge community contribution to development? Sorry, I'm looking at Kerement. Yes. I remember um, that. Yes. Thank you. I would like us to resume the questions after what he, what he said. So would Are people really going to come back or we want to finish? They'll come back. You will? Yes. Okay, I didn't want to tire people. Yes, you come I know it's uh, tea, Thursday. Could we could choose have to have a working tea. Yeah. We're getting back, because I know there are still question sessions here. But also, again, like I said, they, they, I'm not the only one with the answer. I'd like this to be a back and forth conversation with ourselves, yes. right? Yeah. Yes. So thank you so much, our online viewers. We shall be getting back to you shortly, and um, let's pray for the tea. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this time. We pray that even as we discuss, these are fruits that are before you. Nourish them, bless them, but we also invite you to protect them with us through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So let's have some quick tea, then get back to the questions.
I hope so. Yeah. And you can hurt my feelings. You can just say, by the way, just don't come back. Like, go sleep in Kabale, it is all right. I'll also take that. <laughs> And I and I like I'm also serious. I hope we will when we go to for Christmas in our communities that we will look for these stories and send them to Eshpan. So Kerement, we have started. Um, are you having a previous question or you would like them to ask? No, we, we had Hey, Kali. Ended, yes. Kali. The gentleman coming in had a question, yes. Thank you, madam, for, for the presentation. Uh, I must acknowledge and ask for your forgiveness since I came in later. But this is my question. Later or late? Late. <laughs> well, well, it's later because... Well, I'm just teasing. You don't, don't okay. mind me. Yes. My question was, you talked about community philanthropy, which is a very good topic. And it's a very good policy, just in case it's put in, in action. But I have a question, I mean, I have a concern that being a student of history, uh, community philanthropy, it's just a modified word to mean something called, something that was practiced by our ancestors, which was Burundi uh, Bwansi, if you can speak Luganda. Mm -hmm. It was Burundi Bwansi during that time. Mm -hmm. But because of the different trends that have been coming place in Africa and Uganda in particular, things like communism, things like capitalism, things like that, things have changed to the other way around. This is the reason as to why someone once said that things were changing back to their old some state, that every state was going to their old some um, to, to their oneness and leaving every, everyone was now had shifted or everyone has shifted it to, uh, in this generation that they are simply considering their, their own families, their own places, uh, actually not even places, but someone, the, the, the question is, wha, who, the question is me, how am I benefiting from what I'll be doing? Uh-huh, it's in Funilamua in Uganda. Then someone in, I come from a, a, a tiny village in Luero, whereby we have a borehole be, be just before our home. But this borehole, for the time it has stayed there, it is only my dad that will always finance its operation. Just in case he fails to finance it for the rest of the year, it will not be working. Now this is the kind of the society that we are living in today. That community, yes, community philanthropy is something good, but how are we going to bring it, bring it back? Like how are we going to make a typical African, someone like me, or someone that has not, go, because I've gone to school, then I, I have the, I, I can rationalize, but how, the, is someone that has not gone to school, and it's the majority in my, in my village, how are we going to influence them, embrace community philanthropy? Okay, so thank you very much for that question. I think your question makes very many presumptions. And again, I invite us as people in the academia, people doing our degrees, people teaching here, that let's go to look for the alternative narrative, right? Are there selfish people in the world? Yes. yes. Are there selfless people in the world? Yes. So to paint with one brush and call of all of us selfish and we only take care of Mfunina Muwa is one narrative, and can we back it up, I suppose? What we are inviting you to do is also look for and back up the alternative narrative. When do communities, when are communities not selfish? When are people not selfish? And how do we spotlight that? Because again, think if you want to change a story, if you want to change a policy, 
you go out and look for the evidence. And what we want is evidence of communities doing things differently, evidence of communities not waiting for things to happen, but rather making things happen. So yes, in your village, the community is not fixing the well. But what initiative are they rallied behind? So rather than look for what they are not doing, we want to look for what our community is doing and how and with whom and when, whether it is for their own or for others. And remember, we talked about communities. It's not just one thing. It's not just my village and our relatives. There are communities of professionals. There are communities of Rotary Clubs. There are communities of churches. They are commu they are, we, we commune in various ways. So again, let's not come away from here thinking that when we say community philanthropy, we only mean, um, what is my village? Muyenga A village, right? So again, let's open our mind and open our eyes to see various communities and the ways, the various ways giving is done. Because that's the story we want to tell. Are we saying there is no selfishness, in it, selfishness, no corruption? No, that's not what we are saying. We're just saying that can we open our eyes to what is actually going on. When Tibandeke tells his story of a person with physical disability but loving to dance, saying I will use my gift to help other children that are differently abled express themselves through dance. He's not related to any of those children, but he's giving what he has to those children. When Annette tells you that as mothers they congregate to rescue women caught in traffic, trafficking, none of them are their daughters. They are reaching out of themselves, so it is happening. But are there communities that just give to themselves? Yes, they are. So I'm not saying that it's either or. It's, we're not drawing a line in the sand and calling one good or bad. It's just can we look for those unlikely stories where communities, and it's not just a village, communities are giving to address community needs. Thank you. Uh, we're only going to take strictly two questions and we have an announcement. So do not give us a narrative of your question, just be precise and concise. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the way you have outlined your submission. I feel giving goes hand in hand with uh, loving. And Uganda, in particular, in particular Africa, we've come to a, a level where you find that people have lost their love to their communities. Like uh, they have developed that I don't care attitude. So they feel like even if I don't, uh, even if I give, what will I benefit from it? So I would like to know whether, alongside the message of giving, is there something backing uh, backing the giving message up, especially the message of love, like uh, making people feel this is yours, this is what you own. And I feel like if people get to know that this is mine, there's no way they can fail to give. Okay. It's very interesting you asked that question. I just came in from Arusha yesterday, and I was attending a Young People's Leadership Summit called You Lead. And the presentation I gave, I actually called it, What's Love Got to Do With It? And I was talking about philanthropy and business. And the basic message was, if we go back to the definition of philanthropy, it's about love for humanity. Again, we are all, not we are all, we may have an idea of what the Bible says. First Corinthians 13, if I give my life for the poor but have not love, I am doing nothing, right? So again, I think when we essentialize giving to just money, it is very easy for me to be detached. I can give out of obligation, I can give out of wang. Just you leave me alone and I will. Does that kind of giving happen? It does. But 
does giving that is driven by love happen? It also does, right? So again, it is what narrative we choose to see and align behind. Will there be people who give out of selfishness, out of see me and we take the photo and then I go and it's, that show was all about me? Yes. But are there people who absolutely would even die for the very communities they are giving? Yes. And those are the stories we want to tell. And again, remember that my point was, we're not negating the forms of giving that happen. We are simply saying that communities are giving in ways that support community growth, progress, development. That story isn't told enough. We're not going into motivations. That is a question even for research because we might be assuming people's motives. Unless you come and ask me why I have given, you're merely going to assume my motive. So let's tell the story. Let's surface all these questions. At CivSource, we are doing a research in five districts on giving in Uganda. And I was telling Clement, I'd love to come back and share those results once the research is done. But one of the questions we want to ask, because there's no hard and fast evidence for me or for us yet, and we have looked. Who is giving? What are Ugandans giving to? What are the motivations? What drives people to give? And then surfacing that data to present it both for understanding so that we know how, so if giving is mostly done selfishly, how do we motivate people to give with a different motive? If, people, if giving is, but for now we can only make assumptions. And I, I don't want us to keep living on assumptions about the ways Ugandans give. At the very least, let's try and understand what it is. Yes, Burundi Bwansi is another name. I mean, and there, there may be different ways we call the ways communities come together to give. I was trying to remember the, what it is in Runyankori, uh, but I, I've forgotten it. One of the other things that we're doing, which I told the first group that we met, we're even going into proverbs and stories about giving, because it is, it is innate in us as humans to give just as it is to hate, to love, to all those things are human. And so we are saying if giving is part of our social fabric, we should find it in our proverbs, idioms, stories. There should be symbols of giving. So we want to look for that and first put the data on the table. Let's tell the stories. Let's go and find out how are we as Ugandans doing philanthropy. That is the aim. And then what needs to be elevated into a policy conversation? What needs to be elevated in other ways? I hope I've made my point clear. Yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. So Reverend Samson is going to be our last. Yes, whether you have a question or commentary. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I'll go back to the issue of government quickly. Uh, perhaps. Uh, some of the responses which came in about what I said, maybe were not, uh, maybe you misunderstood a little what I was saying. Uh, I'm not saying we are going to go back to government and ask government to necessarily do things for us, although we should. But I think my point was that this being a policy lab, it's government which makes policies. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's no way they can make a policy that supports something like this if they do not understand what community philanthropy is all about. So it is very important that they are able to buy into it. And uh, in their policy formulation, they could make policies that would support this kind of thing. And that kind of, like, sh like she said, it offsets the role of government. So that government doesn't have to do everything. It would be empowering the communities to do uh, some things that it would not be able to do entirely. Uh, giving the example of Rwanda, I'm sure some of you have visited Rwanda. It's a very clean country. But one of the things they do flows from philanthropy, community philanthropy. It is a culture that uh, every Saturday they come together to clean. You know, They come together and clean. And this has been incorporated 
-hmm. in government policy. So on that particular Saturday, everything is set aside mm -hmm. and everyone is encouraged to do the cleaning. So I, I think that's where I was coming from. And uh, it, it also came from a question which was asked, someone said, when attempts are made to take on such an initiative, you receive resistance from government. And I believe the reason why that resistance is there is partly because they may not have bought into this kind of ideology, which I think would be good if, if they can be as well uh, sensitized and then they buy into it. Thank you. So any last burning? Yours is burning. It's not a question. We need a question. question. He can make his comment if that's okay. Okay, I go by the names of Mwesigwe Peter, and I would like to add one reverence point. It's, we've seen it's community through that word. That one. That one. <laughs> community giving. Exactly. Yes. The first word is community. Mm. We have seen a back and forth argument about the government, the government, the government, the government. But what are we saying? It's community. It starts with us, the people in the community. It starts with choosing a perfect leader who has the heart of that word to push it forward and have that heart. So we shouldn't cry about the government, the government, the government. It starts with us. We should at least take the initiative to sieve and get the right person to push to the government who loves that and pushes it forward to better the environment. For the okay, community. thank you. And we were ending soon. More, last one. Okay. Okay. Mine is in. It's a question. Stand up. Joshua, and mine is a question. So, yes, as he has said, it's community. The first word is community. So, it should first start from us. But again, at the end of the day, I'm painting this picture of probably 50 years from now, whereby probably the community giving is 100%. Don't <laughs> so, I'm, I'm, and it, it, it then comes down to then what would be the use of paying tax? What would be the use of the government? If, uh, if community giving is around, you get. So government has to be incorporated in this thing. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. So number one, governments all around the world are receding every day. Populations are growing, needs are becoming much more than any one government will ever meet. Like don't, no one should ever, ever, ever deceive us that any one government will 100% take care of all our needs. So that is one. But two, neither is it true that community giving would ever outstrip government responsibility to give, right? So again, remember I said that it's, there are many ingredients in this development soup. What I think we have done is to pick out the tomato and say it is the ingredient. And we forget, no, 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 to make a good soup, you need all of us. And all we are saying is, can we recognize all the elements in the soup, especially the ones that are least recognized, have least voice. And one of those is community philanthropy. So that is our invitation to say can we also, just as we recognize taxes and we even celebrate tax, the, what does the URA award is taxpayer of the year. How about if we celebrated community givers of the year? In fact, as, as civil source next year, what we want to have is a gathering of givers. Again, just to talk about, celebrate, showcase the different ways that Ugandans are giving. Because right now, it's really not. It's one half of the story that is told. And yet all of us in our various ways are contributing to this soup called development. So that is the invitation that we're not even saying one will displace the other. We're just, first of all, asking that we recognize that it is also as important. 
we are recognizing that it is probably the more sustainable, as I think was your point, because donor interests shift governments, some are corrupt, some will not be, you know, the, the, there are too many variables. The one that is surer is that this is more sustainable because it touches the heart of where the problem is. Like someone said, you know, elephants are not trampling the Minister of Finance's garden. So it is the person whose garden the elephant is trampling that will feel that the urgency of the importance of a trench that solves that problem once and for all. So it's just saying, can we open our eyes and also see how communities every day are addressing the problems that confront them? And once we recognize it, is there a space for policy conversations? Is there a place for celebrating that in ways that are meaningful to communities? Is there a place? What other ways can we do it? You mentioned the story of Randa. Not only do they clean, they have also decided, and Eshban, where is he? Um, what, is, what is that fund? They've also decided to put aside their own fund as Randans to give, so that just as you have a port for tax, a port for, there's another port that is contributed to by Randans. But that tells you a government that is thinking of and factoring our giving into how it does government. But when you have governments that are blind to giving, there's also a downside. So we must generate the evidence, and that generation is through research, through telling the stories, and that's what we would like to do. So that is what I leave us with. The conversation is not done. I'm sure we will, we will be back. We would love to share our research with you, but we also invite you to join us in this journey and help us tell the stories of the wonderful work that is happening in your communities every day. If you can, I'd like that those that are committing to tell the stories, please see Eshban, um, give him your contact so that he can follow up with you for that story. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Miss Asimwe Jacqueline, Mama Omotimo Mugabe, if I may say. Yes, um, thank you so much for our online team that has been very faithful. My name is Michael Clement. It's been a pleasure having you here today. And uh, I just have a quick announcement. The African Union, in conjunction with um, African Peer Review Mechanism, Uganda Christian University, Department of Public Administration and Management, and Africa Policy Center, cordially invite you all to tell a friend of a friend about uh, tomorrow's governance debate. And it's going to be in Inkoyo Hall. And the theme is constitutionalism and the rule of law in Uganda, lessons from the Africa Governance Report 2019. We have um, the governance expert, Professor Migai Akech from Africa Peer Review Mechanism, who will be with us, our own director of Africa Policy Center, and um, among others, to include Lydia Wanyoto. She will be here. So please inform your friends, come with a colleague, and come ready to learn. Before we call this a good evening, allow me to invite my colleague. Um, hi, everyone. I'm called Twesime Jordan McGurin. I'm the Programs and Research Advisor for APC. Uh, thank you so much for coming. Uh, we keep getting more and more people every time. I think some of you attended in the beginning, and we somehow had 15, and now we're at 45. So we are happy. Um, but I want to ask maybe for your help. We're already planning for next semester for policy labs. Every semester we hope to have one student or two students who present their research. As you see, we have many people who are presenting from outside or who are faculty or lecturers at UCU, but we also want students. Um, you have seen uh, kind of the quality we want. We want things that are good, that are well-researched, that people have thought about. Earlier this semester, we had a colleague called Casual Delight yes. who presented about um, reforming uh, toilets yes. and sanitation in, in Uganda and yeah. in the world. So if you are doing research, please come talk with me. If you're interested in presenting, please come talk with me. Yeah. 
Um, if you're doing your degree, it's fine. If you're doing your <coughs> master's, it's fine. If you're doing your PhD, it's fine. Any, if you're doing something research or, or presentation related, and you have something to share with us in our community, please come talk with me. We can get you in our program next semester. And as I said, we're looking for one or two people. Yeah. So we have space for a few. Students. And our topics are quite open. You've seen some topics. This semester we focus much on um, human development, human and social development, and then marriage, family, what? But we have other interests, creation and the environment, yeah. nations, ethnicity, indigeneity, we're interested in um, rule, of law. rule of law, politics, law, economics, human flourishing. We have many topics, huh? Yeah. So please, come talk with me and we can get you in our program for next semester. So I want to thank you all again for coming. We have one more Policy Lab next Thursday. This is the last one of the semester next week, so please come. And then we will see you hopefully next week. Um, let me pray for us as we go and then we can conclude. Our Heavenly Father, God, thank you for this time. Please bless us and grow us in wisdom as we listen to this presentation. Please help us understand the love of humanity. Please help it characterize us in our lives, and please help it characterize our communities. Please, God, give us wisdom to understand this question about how government relates to uh, the community and how we can bring the many sources together to improve human flourishing, God, in general, for your glory. So God, be with us this evening as we go back to our places, and please keep us safe and protected. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you again. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.